collaborative leadership development community for a FTSE 100 company. But all you guys who are in learning and development, you know better than me that I'm going to share with you 10 things we learn. You're going to remember one because we forget 90% of what we learn at places like this, don't we? Look at everything. You're going to have to pick up the information flying at you from all corners. Um, so I want to do a deal with you before we start. I commit to sharing with you 10 hopefully interesting leadership lessons that we picked up in how to run an online leadership learning community. And you commit to me that you'll find one that you find compelling. If you don't find one, I failed completely. And um, you need to come onto our stand, which is K9 over there afterwards. And we'll see if we can find one compelling learning point for you. But my commitment to you is I'll give you 10 learning points that we've learned over the past eight years of running an online community of practice. And you commit to me by show of hands that you will look for the one thing, the 10%, choose what you're going to forget, the other 90%, choose what you're going to remember. So by show of hands, do we have a deal that I'll give you 10, you commit to retaining one? Great, we're off then. So um, the next 20 minutes or so, um, I do expect you to take notes to try and find your one thing. And I will remind you at, what, at some point that you're supposed to be looking for your one thing if it looks like you're not paying attention. Um, the first learning, this might be your one thing, is if you work in leadership development, you know that the big challenge for all of us is uh, they just don't have time. Um, as Carrie Fisher put it, instant gratification just takes too long. Or as the white rabbit said, no time, no time. Now we faced this issue um, Eight years ago, I used to write leadership books. Uh, John Wiley and Sons asked me if I wanted to write the next one. I said, there are far too many leadership books out there. You're churning them all out. People like me can't keep up with them, and you expect me to write another one. So we came to the conclusion that I should write a distilled book of leadership essence. If you could distill leadership learning down into 60-second chunks, which was this book that we produced eight years ago, that would give you the essence of leadership. And I spent a, then spent a few w years working with an organization called the Inspired Leaders Network, where we all came to the same conclusion, nobody's got time to learn. So um, I took that experience and thought, what if, what if we could build a learning community based on not fighting that principle, but based on that principle, that none of us have time to learn? So the IHG Leaders Lounge is built on the principle that if you spend more than five minutes in this community, and you haven't found something to take away and use now that you've learned from your peers or from the collection of learning in there, then we failed you. And for the past eight years, that's worked. We, 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 we measure a lot of things about the community. And one of the things we measure is how long they spend in there. But we reverse the metric. In learning and development, you'll measure how many hour-long courses people have taken. Your SCORM system will show you whether they dropped out halfway through. It's an attendance-based model of learning. We see time as the new currency for the people who are learning. You're, we've been told for 20 years that we're in the information economy, but that's wrong because economics is about the scarce resource, isn't it? And there's too much information flying around. You people are responsible for churning out a lot of it. So am I. It's our fault. The people that we're trying to get to learn and remember things have time as their currency. So we came up with a, a model based on a couple of leadership experts called Rock and Schwartz. It's called an attention-based learning model. We grab their attention for a minute, and then we bring them into the, the community for five minutes. If they haven't found what they need in five minutes that they can use, they can report us. They can report to me. And it works. For eight years, the average time spent in the online leaders' lounge that we run for Intercontinental Hotels Group is four minutes and 30 seconds, roughly. Which brings us to the question, can you learn leadership in 60 seconds? And I'd claim you can. I wouldn't have written a book about it eight years ago if you couldn't. Do you believe me? Do you want to take part in the experiment to prove that you can learn how to lead in 60 seconds by show of hands? I shouldn't have pressed that button. It jumped on too fast. Right, I'm going to give you the 60 second PhD in leadership. This might be your one thing that you remember and take away. This is how it works, four steps. Think back to the best boss you ever had and the worst boss you ever had. Most people find it easy to remember the worst boss, struggle a bit to find the best boss. There are four steps. Think back to all the things done to you that you hated. Don't do them to other people ever. 
Think back, third step, think back to all the things done to you that you loved. Shorter list, no doubt. Do those to other people always. That's 80% of what you need to know about leadership. That doesn't come from me. It comes from D. Hock, founder of Visa, via Tom Peters. This is jumping ahead, bear with me. Um, who is always good value for capturing leadership in 60 seconds. So that's your 60 second PhD in leadership. Excuse me a second. What you need to do in an online community of practice is, is find examples of people doing it. For those based in the UK, we call this the Blue Peter Principle. It's all very well giving them a sound bite like this, but can you prove that it's been done? So we proved it's been done by presenting them with somebody in IHG who's done it before. Those of you who know Blue Peter, this is the here's one we made earlier principle. Um, the Chief Information Officer of IHG is a brilliant man called Eric Pearson. And I was having a chat with Eric and said, what do you want to share in the lounge? And he said, I've got something I call the kaleidoscope of leadership. I hope when you look at me and how I lead, you see little shards of all the best people who ever taught me, who I ever learned from, who was ever my boss, whether at IHG or at Disney where I used to work or at NASA where he used to work before that. So we introduced the lounge community to the 62nd PhD in leadership. We grabbed their attention, got them into the lounge, saying you can learn this in 60 seconds. Before they left, we gave them a practical example of a leader of theirs that does it, um, that reflects all the best learning that he's, he's learned from leaders that have been his boss over the years. So it can be done. I think it can be done. Are you happy that that's a micro lesson that's of value if you're in online leadership community by show of hands? This is interactive here. About half of you, okay. Got half of you still to convince. Um, we put together a whole load of um, little bites of learning from the online community. The problem with atomistic, atomistic learning based on micro lessons is it can all look very disconnected. So we gather together learning from the online community and we publish it in downloadable P PDFs. This is a little example. It's called The Little Book of Leadership. And we gather together 60 second bites of learning like Eric Pearson's within the lounge, gave it to them to download and share in their teams. They downloaded it in droves. It's a trick I learned from a, a slideshow I wrote called The Little Book of Leadership, which claims that you can learn leadership in three minutes. It's full of little learning bites. It's been, download, it's been viewed a million times on SlideShare. For a year, it was the third most viewed SlideShare um, on SlideShare. It's, uh, you, it proved to me that you can gain popularity and attention on this form of learning. If you want to go and have a look, it's called The Little Book of Leadership on SlideShare. There's, there's an IHG version which we use, use internally for their learning. Obviously, that's private. I can only show you some of their learning because it's a, pri it's a private community. We alluded earlier to it's the attention economy, not the information economy. We're swamped with information, so we use this attention-based model of care because it's the attention economy stupid. So your first principle is be quick. They don't have time. Time is their currency. and that's the currency you need to work with. Minimize their time investment for the learning that you give them. The second principle is co-create. T.P. Barnum, the great entrepreneur and impresario said, build it and they will come. I think he got it from the Bible. Um, Abraham asked God how people would get to church. He said, build it and they would come. Nowadays, you build your online learning portal, your learning community, your, learning community, your, your um, uh, learning courses and modules, they won't come because they haven't got time, often it's not relevant to what they need in the moment. But if you let them build it, they'll come. It's the second lesson we, we learnt. These are 50 members of the 1,500 active members of the IHG Leaders Lounge. I spoke to 50 people, 50 of them, before we set anything up, before we designed anything. Spoke to each of them for 15 minutes on the phone. Very natural language, asked them to describe their day to me. What their leadership challenges were in the day, what their management challenges were where the biggest sticking points were, where they went to for leadership help. Was it helpful? Where were the gaps? What did they need? What was the biggest thing that got in their way? The biggest thing that got in their way of getting their jobs done was, unsurprisingly, email. Um, we took what they taught us, one of which, one key lesson that came out of all 50 of them was, we don't have anywhere to reflect and think. If we stop and look out the window, we think we're working because we're thinking, but it doesn't look like we're doing anything. 
and we don't have anywhere we can share from our peers. If I've got a problem running a hotel, we're in the hospitality industry here, I want to be able to learn from somebody else. They love to learn from their peers. So get them to co-build co what you're building. We, we seeded the, the online community we built. I built what you call the straw man in the industry, a little fake version, showed it to the 50, said, is this kind of thing that might work for you? Gave them a couple of examples of micro lessons. Enough of them bought into it for us to try it. But then you seed in your community, lots of little hooks of activity. The ones they bite on, you go with. The ones they don't like, you allow them to wither and take them away. You let them co-create the space they're in by their activity. Don't ask them, they haven't got time. Watch them and watch what they learn. The way you find out what they learn is, it emerges. Does anybody know who this guy is? No, this is a techie conference. Nobody knows who this guy is. This is Boba Fett. You just don't want to admit you know who it is, all you techie boys hiding in the audience. Boba Fett was a meme that came out of Star Wars. Nobody knew, he was a side character, that Boba Fett would become the biggest character in the Star Wars universe outside of the films. In the online communities that people run, he's a hero. They write stories about him, the fans took over the system. Your job is to look for Boba Fetts and find them and don't expect you know where they will be. Because we're moving here from transmission of learning to collaboration and out of collaboration, things will emerge you were not expecting. Um, you don't know the knowledge they have in the community. And through provoking conversations, you can find out what they know. You can spot the good stuff based on what, in our case, IHG told us they want their leaders to do, how they want them to behave. You spot the good stuff that's happening and you amplify that good stuff, play down the weak stuff they send in. Um, we learned this from a guy called Dave Snowden. Um, there's a brilliant paper online I read eight years ago. It was a massive aha moment for me called Bramble Bushes in a Thicket where Dave Snowden and Cynthia Kurtz, Cynthia suffers from second name syndrome. People always remember the first name of the paper. Cynthia Kurtz was just as effective. Um, he said, you have to amplify powerful trends in a community and damp down the weak ones. That's your role as a facilitator of an online learning community. So here's, how does this stuff emerge? Here's an example of something that emerged in the IHG Leaders Lounge, one of the early pieces of practice. You can't read it, I'll tell you what it is. It is private, so we're only giving you snatches of it. A guy that runs an intercontinental in Atlanta sent in a little note saying, we're practicing with self-managed work teams. Is that useful? In the sector you work in, that might be fairly well established. But in the hotels industry, uh, in my summer holidays at university, I did room service um, as my job in, in hotels. And you had to go down into the kitchens. And I remember on one occasion getting an order wrong and the chef threatened me with a meat cleaver. Um, it's the Gordon Ramsay School of Leadership. Um, you're shouted at a lot is how leadership works in, in hotels. Self-managed work teams are unheard of. You do what the bus tells you. So I said, yes, that could be of interest. Give us a quick 60 second write up of how it works. Patrick put this in the leader's lounge. Then you watch and see what happens. In the best case scenario, lots of people start commenting and joining in and sharing the learning, saying I'm gonna use that. If it's not of interest, it'll be like tumbleweed blowing through a town in a western. Nobody's interested, move on to something else. Go with what they grab. On this occasion, a number of comments came in. Comment at the top from a GM in China. Said we've never heard of this kind of learning, we're gonna try it. Dominic Berways, based in France, um, said the same thing. Nameless, faceless guy at the bottom. If you leave the community because you leave IHG, your face and your name disappears. Said, this is great. It replicates what's been what's the best to breed in other industries for a number of years. Very well developed. That disappearing guy was the chief executive. You can imagine the chatter that went around the online community where people were saying, have you seen what Andy Coslett said about what Patrick Birchall's doing? Patrick was swamped with people saying, Patrick, tell us how to do it. If it's that good, we need to know how to do it. Um, a guy called Oliver Horn was opening an intercontinental in Moscow, took the concept of self-managed work teams and worked them up there. A couple of other hotels did the same thing. Now, five years on, it's fairly well established in an IHG hotel, not everywhere, but it's fairly well established in a good number of IHG hotels that they'll have self-managed work teams in advance of the rest of the hotels industry, thanks to Patrick. And that, nobody knew Patrick did it. That emerged from the community. The reason that works so well is that this is something given us as the brief by that same CEO when we were setting up this community. He said, enable up, down, and across learning. He wanted to learn too. 
He said, I want to learn what's going on out in the market, in the corners, and at the edges of all organization. If you do this right, that's what you'll get. You'll get learning emerging that you never knew about. You'll socialize it across the network. It keeps flicking on on its own, it's not me. So your third point, this may be the one thing you take away, is let the learning emerge. How the hell do you do that, you're thinking? Let them teach. Um, you'll be familiar with all this. It's glasses, how we learn. Should be called what we remember, really. We operate down in the highlighted area in this online community of practice. 70% of what's discussed with others, we call them le leadership conversations in the lounge. We use these bite-sized learning to spark conversations. 80% of what's experienced personally is how we learn. We get them to share their own what they've done, and they kind of market test it with their peers to see if it's any good, the way that Patrick Birchall did. 95% of what we teach to someone else. It's that old saw in the learning industry, isn't it? Learning is only a rumor until it's in the muscle. And you only really know something if you teach it. That's how you've learned it. Here's a nice example. Tim Walker Smith was a former medical student, was actually a junior doctor for a while, became the SVP of learning and development at IHG. He's left now. We were chatting about what we do. And I said, what we do is about socializing learning. It's got to be encapsulated. They haven't got time. If we can do it in six words, that's wonderful. Tim said, that's how we learn in medicine. He said, the way junior doctors learn is you see one, an operation, a procedure being done by a consultant. You do one. You carry one out yourself, hopefully more than one. And then you teach one. See one, do one, teach one. That's a brilliant micro lesson. We dropped it in the leader's lounge. It says, this is how Tim learns, learned as a medical student, as a junior doctor. Take this and use this principle in this lounge. You have to teach them about how this thing works because they've never been anything like this before. So let them teach. Tim taught and taught them how to do it. You then find your genius. This is the fifth learning point out of 10. Sorry about the slides jumping. Here's a genius. They will emerge. Find your genius normally means in yourself. This isn't about you. This isn't about transmitting learning from the center. The genius is out there in the community. This is wisdom of crowd stuff. This guy's Vince Garrington. You can't read what he wrote. He went to a primary school to ask them how they dealt with motivating the students. He learned from the head teacher the difference between reward and recognition. Reward is, if a child rides around in the tricycle and doesn't fall off, you say, well done you. That's just a rewarding comment, doesn't really recognize what they did. Recognition says, well done you, you went around the, the playground twice, you didn't fall off your bicycle. You recognize them for what they did. Vince took this principle back to his hotel. What kind of a genius is this man? Um, if you've ever wondered how bright general managers in hotels are, I can tell you there are geniuses out there. And Vince says at the bottom of this, um, I tried it with my ops team. I started congratulating them on what they had done specifically. And the reason this is of value is that IHG, as its overall competencies, wants to get its leaders to recognize people as individuals and get them to learn as individuals. The reason for me this was of particular value is the CEO of the time had a habit of saying to everybody, thank you for everything you do. Every time he said it, I winced. Even when he put things in the leader's lounge, he said, thank you for everything you do. Other people in the community started saying, thank you for everything you do. I thought this may come from the chief executive. It may not. I've got a stamp on this. You do have to do things that make people unhappy. You do have to do things that might politically make waves. I knew the chief executive well enough to believe I could say, don't do what Andy does. Do what um, this guy does instead. Do what Vince Car Carrington does because he gets it right. Recognize people for what they do specifically. That's an established good practice in leadership. We got in lots of learning like that, based on C1, Vince saw what was going on in, in a school. Do one, he did it with his ops team. Teach one, he brought it into the lounge to teach it. Then you then have to package up these bites of learning into little stuff that grabs their attention and can be consumed. So we packaged 10 brilliant things our GM do, GMs do into this little downloadable PDF. We found the, one of the most popular places in the community is a book club. We created a bookshelf in it with downloadable ebooks. We put this in it, said to them, download this, share with your team. The value of the community is partly in what they learn from each other. Scaling that up comes from them teaching outside to their own teams and the rest of the community in IHG what they've learned in the lounge. We get them used to the fact that they're learners and teachers. That's what leaders do. And again, this fitted in with IHG's overall agenda of turning leaders into learners and teachers as part of building Senga's learning organization. 
Here's another genius we found. This is Lizzie Thornquist. Lizzie Thornquist runs a hotel um, Holiday Inn at Heathrow. Before that, she ran a Holiday Inn at Gatwick. Not the most glamorous of Holiday Inns. Whatever hotel I actually put t puts Lizzie in to run becomes the highest performing hotel in the UK estate. Lizzie was a soldier for eight years in the Danish army. She's a trained engineer. You'll find that a lot of your people, if they're trained as engineers, would be very good at sharing learning. learning. I don't know what it is about engineering thinking. Warren Bennis, the Dean of Leadership, says a lot of the best leaders were engineers. There's something about being methodical and being able to build up little things into something big and useful. Um, Lizzie was an engineer and also a soldier in the Danish army. All of hotels, her hotels are at the top of the performance charts from employee engagement to guest satisfaction to profitability. IHG measures all its leaders on 10 measures. We focus as much as possible on shaping our learning, steering our learning when they bring it in to help them develop those 10 measures. And we focus on people who are very good at it and get them to teach the others. Lizzie's one of them. Here's a little example of Find Your Genius. You can't read it, I'll tell it to you. In the hotels industry, as in a lot of your sectors, big problem with turnover. A lot of people leaving. Um, this isn't the war for talent. Don't believe what McKinsey taught us years ago. And Ed Michaels in his book of the same name, it never was. It never was. If you pay the most to the right people, you'll get the best talent. Everybody else is less with the left with the rest. If you're running a hotel and you want high performance out of the people in there, you're not going to get it through high payment because most of them are on a li living wage, on a basic wage. You've got two choices. You can either go the Jack Welch route, which many of you will know, Put your hands up if you're aware of Cull, the bottom 10%. Jack, some of you are. Jack Welch, the most successful CEO of modern times, said his performance management framework was pamper your top performers, move your mid-performers up if you can, cull the bottom 10%. If you did that in a hotel, there's already a big turnover in a hotel, you never have anybody working for you. The alternative, and which is IHG's approach, because we taught them this, comes from a guy called Bum Phillips. Yes, his first name really is Bum. He's an American football coach in America, and his approach to high performance is you get the average players to play good. You get the good players to play great. That's how you win. People in our community love Alex Ferguson. It's a global community. There's a lot of sport for Manchester United all around the world. You have to be careful if you use people like that. You don't alienate the Liverpool supporters and all the rest of the community that aren't interested in soccer anyway. But we know we catch a lot of people if we quote Alex Ferguson. He teaches at Harvard. He teaches exactly the same thing. He always says, I didn't have the best team. I I, my skill was in getting good people to play great. Lizzie put in a little example in the lounge of a troublesome employee who would disrupt any meetings he was in, didn't do enough to be sacked. She consulted with him, said, can I share this in the lounge? He said, yes. I consulted with Lizzie, said, can I share that here? She said, yes. That's why I'm telling you the story. It is a confidential community. She instead of sacking him, thought, I'm going to spend some time with this guy and find out what's wrong with him. It's the normal way of looking at these things. What floats his boat? What turns his lights on? She found he had a tremendous need for recognition. She found that over a coffee. She started inviting him to her morning management meetings. She started inviting him to something she calls the Leadership Academy, which is an online leaders lounge that she runs in Facebook. Before talking to her, I spoke to a few, you, few of you saying, what do you want to learn from this? Uh, one of you said you're looking at setting up LinkedIn communities, Facebook learning communities. You want to see how it works. How do you get people into these things? Um, Lizzie's taken our principle. They can't all be in our leaders' lounge. We're limited to 1,500. But she runs a leaders' lounge equivalent for her people in her team in a hotel called the Leadership Academy, made this guy a member um, and gave him responsibility. She explained to me how she was at the supermarket the other day and found him outside in the car park with a bag of groceries. He jumped in the car, she said, what are you doing? I'll give you a lift back. He said, the chef's run out of herbs. We've got a big banquet today. Um, the delivery didn't turn up. I, on my own initiative, he doesn't work in the kitchens. I, on my own initiative, said, I'll run down the supermarket, get the herbs you need for today. Then he said to Lizzie, Lizzie, you know, the old bastard wouldn't have done this. I'd have called in sick this morning and not come in. But I love working for you. I love working here. More on that one. We gave them a little tool called Find Me an Olive which was something we nicked from Tom Peters, which he nicked from American Airlines. When American Airlines needed to save money, one of their stewards supposedly said, we put two olives in the first class martinis. If you take out one olive and just put one in, they won't notice the difference. It's all about make, saving money without affecting the guest experience in the hotels industry, the passenger experience in airplanes. 
American Airlines claim they saved $40,000 by de-oliving the martinis by one olive. I don't know if that's true. I doubt it very much. But we gave it to the Leaders' Lounge members as an example at a time in 2008 when their leadership priority was cut costs without affecting the guest experience. We said, go get, tell your people to find me an olive. Tell them that story, say, find me an olive. It's a micro lesson. Lizzie said, this guy went through all their past invoices. It wasn't his job for three years. Found a dozen cases where they'd been overcharged and got 10,000 pounds reclaimed, roughly, for the company. Based on, his, based on something that he'd taken out the sheet load with him from our community. She turned him round. She got a poor performing player to be a high performing player. That's how she gets her hotel to be the highest performing hotels across the estate. And she's a genius. So much of a genius. She shares so much learning in the IHG Leaders Lounge. We did it again. You have to make them the heroes of this. She was showing so much learning in the lounge. We made a little ebook from her. Recognize the shape. It's not real. It's just the look of an ebook. Same as our little book of leadership. This is a little book of what Lizzie and her team did at Holiday in Gatwick. It's got 20 learnings from her in there. They love it. She's, she's a hero in the lounge. Just want to check we're covering everything from the title of this seminar that would have brought you here. The title of the seminar is all about how to use emergence, micro lessons, peer learning, and knowledge sharing. And I know you're all here to hear about the toaster oven, those that notice that a toaster oven is part of the talk, and I will get to the toaster oven. But we've covered emergence, that you have to let the learning emerge by getting them to teach. We've covered micro lessons. You can teach leadership with micro lessons. You can make sure your micro lessons follow a learning path that your organization wants for those leaders. Um, and you can get them to share knowledge. I've given you some examples. We'll get to the toaster oven soon. I want to cover 1.6 of your learning, by the way, you've got, that you might want to take away. This isn't a talking shop. We said learning is just a rumor until it's in the muscle. This is about changing how they behave. The CEOs lament in all organize, large organizations, probably yours, is we teach them loads of stuff. Why don't they change how they behave? This is a community of practice. It's about getting them to commit. The way you committed at the beginning of the seminar, I thought I'd introduce you to the idea to taking one learning away. And then we get them to share their learning, share their practice, and take it out and use it. These two guys are on the left, that's Keith Barr. He's the chief commercial officer at IHG. We get them to learn from the senior leaders wherever possible. Keith Barr is brilliant. Um, he loves learning, he loves teaching. He's one of the most self-aware leaders you ever meet. On the right is a guy called Fernando Flores. Anybody ever heard of Fernando Flores by show of hands? Not many. Look him up on the web. He launched a whole new form of management called commitment-based management. He said what Tom Peters often says in his seminars is 67 to 69% of what managers do is talking. That figure came out of some weird survey, but most of what managers do is talking, it's words. Flores said we need a whole new way of talking that is speech acts, language that encourages people to commit and to act. He was um, the youngest ever Minister of Finance um, in Chile. He was 26 when he was Junior Minister of Finance and then of Economics under Allende. He was thrown in prison in 1976 by Pinochet, spent three years in prison and thought, what should I do in my three years? I'll develop a new form of management. And he did. If you ever heard Donald Rumsfeld get in a twiddle with that press conference he was in saying the world's divided into knowns, what we know, what we know we know, what we don't know, what we don't know we don't know, and so on, everybody laughed at him. That was Flores' thinking garbled. Um, uh, and commitment-based management underpins a lot of things that you may well know about in your organization. NLP, anybody? NLP fans? NLP is about getting people to do things. It's about speech acts to get things to happen. Look up Fernando Flores on the internet. Look up commitment-based management. I thought this is a big task, teaching this community about this without giving you all of that background until Keith said, I've got something to share in the community. We started a new team, new chief, uh, new commercial office team. We got them together to share how they were going to lead. They came up with how they were going to lead, same way that we come up with how the lounge is going to work. We let them come up with it. I got them to commit to how they were going to lead. We've got a series of commitments. We all stick to it. That's how we lead. I thought, thank God for Keith Barr. He's shown me how to teach Fernando Flores. So we introduced Fernando Flores, commitment-based leadership, as a big sigh of, I run hotels, give me something relevant. Not the toast to oven, you've got a glimpse, but you're not got it yet. We introduced him to Keith Barr's learning about how you get people to commit, and they were all over him. And we've now taken commitment-based learning, and we're developing the lounge further for 2016 by getting them to commit to missions to change how they act. It's not a talking shop, it's a community of practice. 
And unless you get them to change how they behave, you're wasting your time. And then evidence how they behave by bringing that into the lounge. Toaster ovens. So, oh, seven, by the way, was act, and six was commit. So if you're 10 learnings, six and seven are the most urgent. You've got to get people to act, otherwise you're wasting the time. Play is, is the next. There's lot, we've got a lot of um, play going on here. Um, play informally. This is a toaster oven. This is the toaster oven specifically that we bought for $29.95, including shipping, and sent to this man, Phil Dock who runs a hotel in America. He is not, as he may appear, a guard in a maximum security prison. He's one of the best leaders you will ever meet. Like Lizzie in the UK, whatever hotel Phil's put in charge of in America, the performance metrics soar from profitability to engagement. You can learn a bit more about Phil on his profile page in the lounge, or you could if you would see it. It's a private community, so I kept it small so you can't see it. Phil said I can tell you about his points. Up in the corner, we experimented with points and gamification and badges and things just to see what would happen. Phil got up to 840. Our automated badge system only went up to 500. He joined the 100 club, then the 200 club, then the 300 club, the 500 club, through his activity in the lounge, through what he learned and what he shared. You might be able to see there he's, take, he's consumed 1,356 learning bites and shared 35 of his own. I sent Phil an email saying, Phil, what are you playing at, man? You've raced ahead of our ability to keep up with you. Um, you're 840 points, we only got 500 in this pilot. We discontinued the pilot. You might want to talk about why, why we don't think points work in leadership over on our stand afterwards, if, if you're into points. Um, and uh, Phil said, I'm not into points, really. I'm not into the badges or anything. I'm shooting for a toaster oven. So we looked at each other in my team of six and said, let's send Phil a toaster oven. So we sent him one over the Christmas holidays. This is very recent. And um, Phil sent us this email back afterwards saying, Happy New Year, guys. Hey, I've got a toaster oven in my office. When I came back from vacation, as with most Americans, but particularly in the hotels industry, one day vacation, Christmas Day, uh, there's no name or card on it. So we sent him a note back saying, guilty as charged, Phil, we thought we'd send you this little gift for being such an amazing leader. We thought you'd like it. And Phil sent a note back saying, well, I, I love it. I'm going to cook a London broil in your honor. We're based in the UK. I don't even know what a London broil is. And he said, thank you for everything you do. In 2016, I'm going to shoot for the car. So you've got to watch it when, you, when you're choosing to give them prizes. They'll start um, bringing in inflation into your prize system. But do play with them informally, in the moment, spontaneously. Somebody once said, um, Daniel Goldman, actually, the emotional intelligence author, said laughter is the shortest distance between two people. There's a whole school of leadership learning based on getting people to laugh with you. You don't laugh with people you don't trust. You only laugh with people you trust. If you it doesn't mean you have to be a comedian, but if you laugh in your team and you can laugh with your team, and you can laugh with your community of practice, you strengthen trust and engagement. The ninth lesson in our 10 commandments of learning is, I want you to think for a minute how we learn. The title of this talk also talks about human learning and the human secrets of how we learn. This is how we learn to lead. I used to be a journalist. I once had to interview Steve Ridgway when he was managing director of Virgin Atlantic. I was put through to him on the phone for three minutes, I thought they'd made a mistake and put me through to Richard Branson because Steve Ridgway was talking in Richard Branson's voice. Many years before that, I was a historian. Kamenev and, and Zinoviev were two Bolshevik leaders under Lenin. They both started to write with Lenin's handwriting. Um, there are examples from the capitalist world, too, of how we influence people as leaders. Uh, Walt Disney used to write with a red pen. He used to put marks in reports, in scripts, in red pen, hand and back. After he died, Marty, Marty Sklar, who's an Imagineer at Walt Disney, took up a red pen. He's st there's still people writing with red pens in Disney because of Walt Disney. They still ask the question when they're puzzled and don't know what to do. What would Walt do? The way leadership impacts us and the way we learn about leadership is unusual. It's odd. It's almost viral. We learn, as this little chap's learning, by example. We follow people we admire, we respect, and we want to be like. It's what Eric, the Chief Information Officer at IHG, said early on, I hope you see in me all the people I liked and admired and wanted to be like as a leader because I lived that. I used to do leadership development with the NHS um, when a guy called um, Adrian Halligan was the uh, Chief Governance Officer at the NHS. And the NHS urgently needed to improve its leadership. Aidan was a consultant, obstetrician, so he was free to say, 
consultants in NHS hospitals are the worst leaders in the world. They're arrogant, they talk down to nurses, they won't listen to nurses, they won't listen to junior doctors. We need to change how we lead in the NHS to improve patient care at the very worst extremes to stop people dying. So Aidan called me in once a week for a few months and we'd have little powwows around the table with his leadership team and we'd look at what leadership needs to be in the NHS. Aidan came running into the meeting one day, said, Phil, I found it, I found the secret of leadership. It's three words. I love micro lessons, I love anything that, that encapsulates learning, but doesn't lose or isn't superficial. As Einstein said, simplify everything, but not too much. And Aidan came running in, sat down breathlessly and said, leadership is example. That's all leadership is, three words. That's how we learn. Again, as with the 62nd PhD leadership, yeah, 80% leadership is by example. There's a lot of learning in leadership circles that prove this, from MIT professor Edgar Schein to Warren Bennis, known as the Dean of Leadership. I was very lucky Warren Bennis taught me some of my leadership stuff. Um, uh, the Financial Times calls Warren Bennis the, the guru of leadership. La Warren just says we learn by watching other people and copying them. Leadership is just by example. So, nine things. Did you find your one thing? I'm going to ask you in a minute, all those who put your hand up. Remember our commitment at the start of this seminar? What one thing did you find most useful you're going to take away? Um, I'll do a quick re recap of the nine. No time. It's the attention economy. Time is their currency. You have to minimize it, not maximize time spent learning. Co-create. Let them build it, and they will come. You almost got the top secret one there. Emergence. This is a w use the wisdom of crowds. The learning's out there. You have to trust it will emerge. How to emerge? Let them teach through peer learning. I've shown you how to, how to let them teach. Find your geniuses and they will teach for you. Um, get them to commit and to act. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. It's all about practice. Play in the moment. A lot of leadership learning is about formal tools and practices you use, routines you go through. Leadership happens in the moment, spontaneously. And we, you need to play in the moment spontaneously in the community to, to emphasize that. And then we learn by example. Your community of practice needs to get them to share real learning examples of what they're doing. There's a tenth. It's our big secret. You won't tell anybody about this, will you? Should not mention this in, an, in a technology show. Somebody came onto our stand and said, how do you get people to come back in? Hi, John. We email them. It's the lowest form of technology you could have. I'll email them something like, a subject line will say something like, have you seen what Tracy said yesterday? Tracy's our EVP of HR. They love Tracy. You learn over time what they love and what they don't love, and you play to what they love. We've got a, a lot of African-American um, colleagues in Atlanta, where HG's American headquarters in. I know now that if I say, you've seen what Colin Powell did, I'll get a spike of interest from that corner. Um, we know that they love what the CEO says. If we drop in a subject line saying, did you miss what Richard said yesterday? We'll bring them in. You've got to grab their attention. It's an attention-based learning model. You do it with email. We, um, we're, our community consumes 10,000 micro lessons a week in the Leaders' Lounge, 1,500 of them. Two thirds of those come by email. The other, the other third, they come in and pick them up in the lounge. Once they're in the lounge, they pick up three bytes of learning on average. They spend about four minutes and 30 seconds in there. So the tenth thing is very counterintuitive in a technology show, use email wisely, particularly counterintuitive and then when I spoke to those 50 people to start with, do you remember? I said, what's the thing that gets in your way of learning and working and is the bane of your life? It was email. I hate sending them emails. We try not sending them emails. When we don't send them emails, usage in the community dives to uh, anything down to 10%, 25%, 35%. So we send them a note saying, sorry, it's another email. They say, it's all right, we like yours. And they use them when they learn. So. Did you find one thing out of those 10? Can you put your hand up if you reached your commitment? I'm going to ask you, ooh. Some of you did. Can I ask you what your one was, if you don't mind? But an emergence. Excellent, that's one of the most powerful. So do you mind if I ask you what your one thing is? Your yeah, emergence. Everybody else with emergence? Anybody else not emergence? One thing that's not emergence? What was yours? Get them. Get them building. You do need to cut, thank you. You do need to get them to co-build this. Um, even now, we're still co-building with them. There are areas of the lounge we love, they hate. We say goodbye to them and archive them. Now, I wrote a paper about this eight years ago called Open Source Leadership, very grandly. I've spent the last eight years with IHG trying to prove it works. 
Um, you can get a copy of this paper over on our stand. It's also an independent case study produced by the Corporate Executive Board on our, board on our stand and a How It Works brochure. Um, as a thank you to all you who stayed all the way through, it's also copies of my book that my colleague has got here. Do pick one up as a thank you from me for spending 30 minutes with us. Remember, surprise them with unexpected rewards. There's your reward there at the back if you sat through all of this, particularly if you, if you took part in the commitment and have taken up one piece of learning away. I think we're to the end of time, so I don't want to take up more of your time. You've got lots more to learn. But we're on stand K9 if you want to have a chat about, about how we do this. It's best I now say goodbye and let you go on and learn some more. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.